Hey, everybody, welcome to Plant Prescription, the Costa Farms podcast, where we help answer all of your common planting gardening questions. Uh, I'm Justin Hancock, horticulturist here at Costa Farms. This is Michelle, our integrated pest management manager. Um, and today, episode number two, we're going to be talking about all kinds of fun things, uh, including low light plants, spider mites, um, and how to get plants to grow faster. <laughs> Sounds like a fun one. All right. So what was that first one you said, Justin? All right. So question number one, uh, it comes from Julianne in Meadowboro, Massachusetts. Um, she says, I'm looking for a couple of plants in my department, in my apartment that don't get a lot of light. What would you recommend? Oh, well, that's a great question. Uh, for anybody watching on YouTube, I've got a lot of those behind me right now because it looks like a black wall behind me. Uh, Gosh, I feel like this is a really common question. You know, uh, my friends ask me this all the time and it's, it's, it's tricky because I think that you could grow a lot of plants in low light. Now, if they'll grow well or quickly, that's a different thing altogether, but we do have our common ones. Um, we've got our Sansevierias and I know that everybody, you know, we can think that Sansevierias are kind of boring. It's the snake plant, the mother-in-law tongue. But there's some really cool varieties of this one out there now. There's obviously the typical mother-in-law tongue, the snake plant. But there's uh, another one called whale fin, and that is my personal favorite because uh, it just looks like this one giant, well, fin coming out of the plant. Um, I can't, I mean, is there any other way to describe that other than a whale fin looking plant? Oh, and it feels like shark skin. If you've ever pet a shark. Uh, that, that's what the plant feels like. And if you haven't pet a shark, then just go grab a whale fin Sansevieria because it's basically the same thing. Um, so Another really cool thing about Sansevieria <laughs> too um, is that you've got the bird's nest types, you know, that stay really small and compact and they're great for tabletops. Yep. And then you have the, the more traditional like floor plant ones that can get three feet tall. Yep. Um, and so there's a lot more there, there's a lot more texture, I think, than a lot of people first realize if they're new to Sansevieria or if you want us to be super duper up to date Dracaena since botanists decided to reclassify it. What? They renamed it or has yes. it always been like that? OK, no, Sansevierias are now technically botanically Dracaenas again. Oh, why did they do that to us? OK, so. Dracaenas, but we can all agree that there's a Dracaena out there for everybody, right? Indeed. <laughs> I feel like a salesperson right now, not trying to sell you on that one, but you should, you should get one if you don't have one, you would like them. So, okay. Other than Dracaena, Sansevieria, whatever you want to call it nowadays, uh, what else is there? I have, I, I was thinking maybe a cat palm, if you're going for like the more, uh, tropical foliage look and like the palm trees. One time I had a majesty palm and I tried to make it a shade plant and it did not do that. So no, they whatever you definitely do, highlight plants, super highlight and whatever you do, do not put a majesty plant and think it's going to be a good indoor plant unless it's in front of like this giant full sun window. window. Yeah. But cat palms, those are the low light palms, aren't they, Justin? Um, yeah, they can handle low light, I think, better than than most. Um, I think even better than a than a palm is uh, ZZ, Samuel Colchis. Yeah. Um, you know, they are right up there with Sansevieria in being practically indestructible. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, low light, medium light, bright light, forget to water them for a month. They're like, Hey, look, I still look good, even though you are ignoring me. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about CZs without mentioning Raven, uh, because it's so cool with that lime green, new foliage that slowly turns that rich purple, black color. Great contrast for your other houseplants. And if you want to be trendy, it's super trendy right now. If you're, it if you're worried about that. trendy. Yeah. So, but aside, you know, from trendiness and people would argue that this is not a trendy plant because everybody thinks it's the boring basic plant, but you cannot go wrong with a pothos or pothos, however you want to That's say That's exactly it. what I was going to say as Were super you? trendy because people are collecting them like crazy they right are. now. Yeah. We have no idea how many emails we get, you know, for people asking, where can I find Manjula? Where can I find Global Green? Where can I nice. find? Skeleton key, which, you know, 
that's a difficult one to find, but that's very, very trendy right now, I would say. But I'm so glad because Pothos or Pothos, I, you know, I call him Pothos. And I, it's going to be hard to break me of that. But Pothos went through this period where they were they were like, oh, it's a Pothos. How boring. You've got a Pothos. And I just love the fact that they've made a comeback. And I mean, they're just like flourishing now. I mean, if you have a wall that you want to plant to trail down, you cannot go wrong with Pothos. It will fill that wall. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. What's your favorite pothos, Justin? Oh, favorite. Um, you know, it just might be Manjula mm-hmm. because it has those those bigger leaves and the variegation pattern is a little more erratic. And so you'll get some leaves that have the green center or the, the white center. You'll have some leaves that are more splashy. Mm, that is a good one. What's I like yours? That one. Uh, it's tough. Are we, we're considering epiprenum pothos, right? Yes. Okay, well then that's easy. <laughs> Epiprenum panatum variegata, done. Love that plant because when it grows up, it gets that kind of um, uh, it just like gets larger, and you get fenestrations and this marbling look to it. I do love that plant, and it's a like a white variegation. I like that. I really love mine too, which I got from you. So thank you. Yay! You're welcome. Sharing is caring. Oh, I have exactly. one. I have one more plant on my on my short list for uh, you know low light, and that for me, if you're looking to add a pop of color to a space, I would recommend Eglonemas. Um, that was going to be my next one too. Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm really glad we're on the same page with that one too. I've got a couple. Again, I, I think that they're like the ZZs. I don't water mine very often. Um, and they do just fine. That's kind of the way they like it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything else, Justin? Because that was pretty much it for my short list. Well, you know, one of the fun things about um, Eglonema, there's such a, a range. You've got the the good old-fashioned green varieties that are often variegated with silver. But mm-hmm. then you've got the, the colorful varieties um, yes. that are pink or red or purple or chartreuse. Um, and it's just, it's so much fun to play off the colors and the textures, uh, both with your traditional greenhouse plants, but then other variegated varieties. It's just a nice pop. And if you're really into the whole, uh, collector playing with plants, there's a lot of aglaonemas out there and some of them are quite difficult to come by as well. Um, I have a Pictum tricolor and, uh, I am very ashamed to admit that that is the only plant I cannot, for the life of me, get to grow. So uh, if you're up for the challenge, you could try one of those. But let me tell you, I have had a difficult time with those. I would just stick yeah, to the that's, colorful ones. Yeah, that's why we don't grow that one. It's just no. too tough for the the average average condition. It's hard. And, you know, I'd like to think that I take very good care of plants and I can grow a lot. I mean, I've got a lot of plants, a lot of rare plants, a lot of a lot and I don't know what it is about that one in particular. So if you are up for the challenge and you are one of those, you know, collectors who want to try out a rare plant, I would I would caution against that one. But you could if you wanted to. But we also have a super fun variety that we've released this year called Slim Jim uh, oh. that I'm kind of fond of because it has really narrow leaves. And so it's it's almost grassy compared to other Eglonemas. Um, and you can see a picture of it if you go to costafarms.com, go to the Chinese Evergreen page and scroll to the bottom. Um, there's a bunch of pictures of different varieties there, but Slim Jim is is totally different than the others. I forgot the name of those was Chinese Evergreen. I haven't seen that one yet. I want to see that one. I'm going to go to the site after this. Huh. That sounds pretty cool. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Uh, question number two. Uh, this is from Cassidy in Decorah, Iowa. Um, how do I get rid of spider mites? I think I have them on my palm tree. And the very first thing I'm thinking is, well, of course it's a palm tree because a lot of palms are sadly spider mite magnets. Yep. Yep. I'd be impressed if a palm didn't have a spider mite. Uh, oh, man, spider mites. It's funny because I think they're literally everywhere. Um, they're technically a tropical pest, but, you know, when you're an indoor house plant, it's 
similar to Dropbox A, i.e. it doesn't freeze. Hopefully it doesn't freeze inside of your house. If it does, I'm so sorry. Um, but hopefully it doesn't freeze inside your house. And so these little suckers, man, they can fly under the radar because they're super duper tiny and they have such a broad host range. Palms definitely being one of them. And I've English noticed Ivy. Calatheas for me was a big one. Um, if I ever want to grow spider mites, which yes, I do for fun every now and then grow spider mites. Uh, I Why is that fun? <laughs> because it's fun to try to, <laughs> it's fun to kill them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, I'm learning something totally new about you. <laughs> I grow things to kill things. Um, uh, so, but I mean, nine, 10 times out of 10, I can find them on my Calatheas. And if I had a lot of palms, I would imagine I would find them on there as well. So spider mites, super tiny. Honestly, most of the time you don't even know you have them until you see the webbing. And the webbing is the reason why they are called spider mites. Um, there's a whole lot of mites, uh, most common one being spider mites. Or two-spotted spider mites are honestly the more common ones. And if you really want to get in there and like learn more about these bugs, again, I would highly recommend a hand or a jeweler's lens um, or getting a little attachment for your phone. There's billions of them on Amazon now. And taking a really close look, and if they have two little saddle straps on the side of their bodies, like black saddle straps, those are probably two-spotted spider mites. Now, they can be different colors. All right, I told you I wouldn't go off on a tangent, and here I go. I'm going to jump to the killing them part very soon, I promise. They can be different colors, though. Um, notice that in the winter, they can get kind of a reddish look to them. And uh, there are a couple of species that are not all two-spotted spider mites. But if there's webbing on your plant, they are in the spider mite family. Um, I've also read the color can vary depending on what they're eating. Absolutely. And so different plants can absolutely impact the, the coloration of your spider mites, which is absolutely. really disturbing to think about. But do you that's wanna, why I don't like to think too much about spider mites. Do you want to know something um, a little gross and fun? Because, I mean, I always add gross and fun things to this. <laughs> is it is it grosser than last last episode? I mean, everybody does it. So it's not that gross. Uh, okay. It's poop. Um, so... <laughs> So I just gave it away. But the two black saddles, saddle patches on the side of the spider mite's body, you don't see them when they're younger. You only see them when they, you know, they mole and, and get older. And that is because it's poop. <laughs> just thought y'all would like that. Uh, anyway, okay, so spider mites, they cause webbing. Doesn't look like spider webbing, though. You can, if you get enough spider mites, which I hope you don't, but if you do, you'll start to notice that the webbing of the spider mites is, um, like, thinner and a lot closer together versus the spider webbing. It's going to seem a little bit thicker, like thicker webs, wider apart. Um, and so the spider mite webs are very fine. And it's, go ahead. I've always thought they look more like cobwebs than spider webs. They do. They're very fine and they're very like close together. Um, and so, and they don't go far off the plant. Oftentimes if a plant has a leaf that has like ridges in it, you'll see the webs in between those two, um, like in between the hill of the leaf or the slope of the leaf. They're not going to go from like the top of the leaf all the way across the room. Like that's not going to happen with a spider mite. They're going to be pretty tiny webs. So anyway, they're hard to see. Um, if you get the plant wet, they'll stand out. If you missed it, they'll stand out. Um, but webbing, spider mites, they're everywhere. It's so hard because you could look at a plant when you get it, and if you don't see one or two mites, they can reproduce asexually. It just it gets like out of control quickly. Spider mites are really good at making babies. So the easiest way to kill them, um, it, it depends on how many plants you have. For somebody like me who has a lot of plants, I would go one route, um, but if you have a few plants on, you know, and one of your plants has spider mites, first of all, quarantine that plant if possible. Get it away from the rest of your plants because they do walk. Um, they are curious little things and they will walk and their host range is huge. So you don't know what plant it's going to get on next. Now, I've read, and, and this this always kind of skeeves me out to think about, um, mm -hmm. is that because they make the webbing, they can make like little parachutes of, of webbing yes. and then move around your house through the ventilation system in theory they could do that you know when i think of that i just get this image of little uh secret agent spies like going through your ducts 
I just, I just imagine like a 007 music riding along with them through the wind. They could do that. They definitely could shoot off some webbing and definitely travel to another planet. Now, if they'll go through all of your ducks successfully and land on another planet, I don't know. Because, I mean, they don't last long without food. And they're so tiny, it's hard for them to travel huge distances. Um, that, that does crack me up, though. Um so anyway, so for somebody with a, you know, one plant, get it away from the others. First thing you do. And um, spider mites, you'll find them on the bottoms of the leaves, like on the undersides of the leaves. That's where they hang out. That's where they throw their parties, their big old keggers, yada, yada, yada. Um, and that is where you want to be treating the plant is on the bottom. It wouldn't hurt to do a quick treat on the top, but 99% of those mites are going to be on the underside of the leaf. So a couple of things you could do is... Easy peasy. You could get a wet washcloth and literally wipe the underside off. I like to do like a double whammy um, where you could get an oil. It could be neem oil. Um, it could be just Monterey horticultural oil. That is another one that's really good. It does not have to be neem oil. The one thing it cannot be is kitchen oil. Do not use olive oil, any of those larger oils, um, because those are like larger grade oils. You want the finer grade with like the tiny little droplets um, and horticultural oil, especially. Um, so any oil will do. You don't have to use neem, uh, but you could spray the under undersides of the leaves. I like to get like a little spray bottle. You don't have to go out and buy a giant, um, you know, like, what is it? Pump sprayer. You don't have to do that. And honestly, sometimes the droplet size on those is pretty big. I like my little, my little, um, travel size, little spray bottles. Cause those produce a uh, fine mist. And then just spray the undersides of the leaf with the oil. Make sure you're not doing this during the day. There you are. Uh, because if it's sunny out and you're spraying with the oil, it can burn the plant. So make sure if it's an outside plant, do it at dusk or at night. Um, you don't want sun hitting this after you put oil on. But just spray the underside of the leaf with as fine of a mist as you can of the oil. Um, you could wipe it off and spray it again. Um, or you could just leave it on there. And what the oil does is it'll kind of surround the adults and the eggs and it's a suffocant. It'll suffocate them. It looked like you were going to say something, Justin. So I wanted to give uh, you room to interject there. My, my, my internet went out, so I don't know if I'm repeating <laughs> something you already said. Um, you know, but to me, the, the, the number one, the single most important thing um, to think about if you're going to be treating spider mites is you can't do it once. Uh, one and done never, ever, ever works because they reproduce so quickly. Um, you know, if you treat with horticultural oil, you're killing the adults, uh, but the eggs will hatch. And then all of a sudden there's a new a new generation. The, the sequel uh, is coming after your plants. And they have a pretty short uh, life uh, or a pretty short turnaround time, let's say. If you are in a warmer house or if you are outside and it's summer and it's warm, they're going to be reproducing much faster than if it's cooler. Um, another thing that I've noticed uh, is that they tend to really enjoy drier climates. Um, and so that's why sometimes in the wintertime, you'll see them explode. Uh, it's something about that drier, warmer air that really gets them going. Um, so, but aside from just horticultural oil, you could also use an insecticide, but be careful because not all insecticides will kill mites. Mites are not insects. Mites have eight legs. Insects have six. So, I, 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 why are you laughing? This is just, it's true. It's just like, it's just like now how sensitive areas are called dracaenas. This is, this is now a, this is a fact. <laughs> it is a hundred percent true. <laughs> well, actually, um, technically the, um, proto nymph only has six legs. It's really weird. And only later does it get eight eggs. So if you're looking for something other than an oil, make sure it just has a mita side on the label because that's what you need. And then again, like when you spray, you just got to hit the undersides of those leaves. And like Justin said, you can't just do it once. I would start off with twice a week in the beginning and then go down to once a week. That's what I would do. Um, and that for me, if you have a couple of plants where you can flip the leaves, that works. I'm going to bust a myth here too. Mites, well, spider mites are not breeding in your soil. You may have mites in your soil. You may have to try to, uh, 
detrivores, mites that are eating decaying matter, not hurting your plant, could even be good mites um, like hypoaspies, which they also name to stradiolapses. Don't get me started on that. Um, but you could also have good mites in your soil, but it is not spider mites. Spider mites will not be in your soil unless you knock them off the plant um, and then they'll be there. But they're not, don't worry about treating your soil for spider mites. Focus on your plants, specifically the undersides of the leaves. Where was I going with that? Okay, so, then, <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry, I told you I wouldn't get on a tangent. You know, these bug questions, mite questions, sorry. <clears throat> Mites are not bugs. Okay. Um, so, but that's if you have a small amount of plants that you can easily flip the leaves over. For me to do that would take me days. It's just not worth it. I can't do it. I have too many, too many plants. Or maybe you have a plant with smaller leaves. Um, Versus like a banana, I'm sorry, well, you could have a banana, uh, or a white bird of paradise or a monstera. Something with larger leaves is easier to like treat. But if you have a plant with smaller leaves, or if you have a lot of plants like yours truly, the lazy man's method, um, which honestly works the best for me, and which I'm sure is very popular, is a... Uh, Beneficials. Again, I'm going to go back to beneficials. And I know there's a stigma about adding more bugs, but if you're in a pickle like me and you get a lot of mites on 500 plus plants with little tiny leaves, you don't have time to go and flip each one over and spray it. You just, if you do, I, I'm very envious of that. Um, but if you buy a product, uh, you could buy Persimilis. Uh, Persimilis is a predatory mite. It's funny. It's a mite that eats another mite. Um, and these are little orange dudes with like big legs. Uh, they're very, very fast. And their main goal in life is to eat spider mites. Um, and they are literally one of the best bios out there for spider mites because most of the bios and beneficials will prevent problems. But Persimilis is unique because it will cure your mite problem, which is awesome. So all you need to do is sprinkle them on the plant. You don't need a whole lot of them um, because they can eat spider mites faster and reproduce faster than the spider mites. So it's just biology. If you put them on there, they will eventually overtake them. Depending on how many you put on is how fast it's going to take. Um, so they will go after these spider mite eggs and the adults. Um, I've seen them, they go after the eggs first. I think it kind of helps them with their egg laying. So that's really great. You're taking care of the next generation right off the bat. Um, and then they'll go after the adults and how they do it. It's awesome. They basically just stab them and just suck them dry. It is worth noting that these guys are blind. Um, and so they're not going to be looking for your mites, but they are evolved to kind of sense them with like chemo receptors. And if they feel webbing, they're going to intensify their search and just like go crazy over the mites. And let me tell you, these guys are curative. They really are. And if you're lazy or if you have a lot of plants like me, I fit both of those categories. Um, this is really the way to go. You can just sprinkle a little bit. It comes in vermiculite carrier. So it's going to be a little bit messy. Um, but you can sprinkle a little bit on top of the leaf. Try not to sprinkle it in the soil because it's just a long way for them to go up to the plant to find the mites. And they may not because they're blind. So you do want to put them generally where the mites are. These guys will travel pretty far. I've, in the greenhouse, I've seen them travel 20 feet. Um, wow. So, yeah, it's crazy. We didn't want them to travel 20 feet, <laughs> but they did. Um and uh, yeah, it's, but I don't, unlike the spider mites who have little 007 parachutes, <laughs> these persimilas don't produce webs, so they won't be doing that. Uh, mites can come in on your clothes too. So if you get mites, it's, it's gonna have, especially if you have a lot of plants, you've probably gone through it once or twice or more than that, um, because they can come in on anything. They can come in on your pets, on your clothes. Um, the one thing they you will not find mites coming in is in your soil. For spider mites, they are not going to be in your soil. Um, they could be other mites, but they're not spider mites, not the ones that are feeding on your leaves. All right, and so I know this is kind of, oh. I'm going to stop. So <laughs> Something that Michelle alluded to earlier, but just to spell out too, um, controlling your environment the best you can. Um, because they don't like cool, moist air, um, you know, anything you can do to to drop the temperature a little bit, 
um, or increase the humidity will also slow the rate at which they reproduce. The slower they reproduce, the faster your attack on them is effective. I want to add one more thing. Uh, if you, speaking of temperature and all of that humidity, if you do use the persimilis root, which I highly, 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 highly recommend, um, you have to make sure that your environment is um, like, I think it's 50% humidity. So it may not work in the winter for you if you use persimilis, because if the humidity is low, persimilis are the opposite of mites. They like it humid. Um, and so if, if you use these and the humidity is too low, your persimilis population could die out uh, because their eggs could desiccate. There's a couple of theories on this. We're not going to get into it. Maybe one day. Uh, but your persimilis like it humid, so it may not work for you in the winter if you're heating. Excellent. Thank you for that brief introduction <laughs> to spider mite control, Michelle. <laughs> I, I just really can't get over the vision of little spider mites just like 007 parachuting through the ducks. I just love that. Um, all right, all so right. what's next? Hopefully no more bugs. All right. Uh, Dennis in Idaho Falls, Idaho um, says, I want my new Monstera to really grow. How should I be fertilizing it? Hmm. Well, I took up all the time on the last question. So Justin, what do you think? You know, I think fertilizer is like the the hardest easy concept in plant care, um, because that's, that's you know you can make it as it. yeah you can make it as complicated as you want. Yep. Um, monsteras aren't particularly fussy, so any general purpose houseplant fertilizer is going to do the trick. Um, make sure that it's either labeled or a, as a houseplant fertilizer, or if it's like a totally general purpose fertilizer, you're following the houseplant instructions on the label. Yes. Uh, because you definitely don't want to add too much. If nope. you do go a little too much, um, the all of the, the 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 nutrient salts in the fertilizer uh, they'll burn the roots, preventing it from being able to take up water, um, and you could injure or kill your plant with too much. But if you follow the fertilizer instructions or back off and do less than the fertilizer instructions recommend, you should always be fine. Yeah. So. I've oh, made that on. mistake. I'm really ashamed to admit it, but I've done that before. I did not follow the label on a fertilizer. And I thought, oh, let me just give it a lot of fertilizer. It'll be fine. I've done this before. And I came in and the plants were wilting uh, because all of their roots were burned off and gone. And it's it's kind of counterintuitive that something that's supposed to make your plant grow faster kills it. But Justin's absolutely right. The salts will burn your roots. So, and people are so afraid of that. And I feel like we're not helping right now by saying that. Don't be afraid to fertilize your plants. Um, Just don't do more than than is ever recommended. No. In fact, I would always, I, from there on, even before then, which is what I've done forever, I don't know what got into me that day, uh, I always use like the lowest possible rate. And then I go a little bit lower. Um, and I will feed my plants frequently. Um, I'll feed them. It really depends on you and your environment and your watering schedule. But I will feed mine at least once a month. Um, and these are indoor plants, uh, but I go with a lower rate and it, I have always of the mentality low and slow, uh, is better than a lot at once. And then you back off because low and slow, the plant kind of gets used to it. It never struggles. You're not at risk of burning it. So I would always go with like the lowest rate and then a little bit lower and then maybe every other week or every month, depending on your light and how much you water. Absolutely. Um, and another thing that I think makes fertilizing seem more complicated than it really is, is that every fertilizer package has its own set of recommendations. There's not a one size fits all. Here's how much you should use, how often. Um, mm -hmm. So always, always follow the directions or less. Um, and you, you can't really go wrong with that. Um, and then as Michelle alluded to, oops, sorry. Did, mm -hmm. did you want to jump in? Uh, well, I was just, I, I was going to throw my favorite fertilizer out there because I think you were saying, don't overcomplicate it, any general purpose fertilizer. And it's really hard to go wrong with miracle Grow. I'm going to throw my hat, I'm going to throw my hat in there for miracle Grow. That is like a 201020, which I'm sure we'll go over at some point what that means. It's basically the NPK nitrogen, uh, 
phosphorus, phosphorus potassium. Oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? <laughs> okay, but uh, it's it's basically just the nutrients, uh, and that is a pretty hefty dose. But they they like uh, they've made it so that it's generally pretty safe, uh, and you can see the water turn like a blue or a dark blue. Stay away from the dark blue. Uh, I just like Miracle Grow, and because it has that higher nitrogen, it tends to like the plants grow much bigger, much faster. That's just me though. I don't, I don't want to get it too complicated. That's why I always just stick to my basic one. It's worked for me. Hey, do you, which one do you use, Justin? I use whatever's on sale. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miracle Grow is pretty cheap, you know, but yeah, there's, I've used a couple of the organic chicken feed ones. Woo. It smells just like chicken poop. Tuck, this is a poopy episode for me. It smells just like chicken poop. I would not recommend um, these if you do windows down for that one. Although that is better than the fish emulsion, uh, because fish emulsion really, really do smell like fish. And for some reason, um, that smell seems to hang around your house. And I know that we are sounding like you should not fertilize because all kinds <laughs> of bad things can happen. It's really not true. <laughs> Just make sure it's a fertilizer for inside and you follow the directions. But if you're a fisherman, you may like that smell. I mean, some people like the smell of fish. <laughs> okay. Nobody likes um, the smell of chicken poop, though. All right. So, and 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 something that Michelle said earlier to allude to um, is the amount of light makes a huge difference. You know, light is the fuel for the plant, and so if it's in a low light spot, um, fertilizer is only going to help it to a small degree. Uh, but if it's in a high light spot, the combination of lots of bright light and extra nutrients, then you'll really, really see a difference. So, you know, even though Monstera tolerates low light, move it to a brighter spot as you, if you can, if you really want to see more growth from it. Yep. Yep. Slowly. I have most of my Monsteras in lower light, but I, they tend to be pretty hungry plants too. They're really forgiving plants. Monstera deliciosa. They're very forgiving. You can let it go dry. You can keep it wet. I, I like Monstera deliciosa a lot. All right. Did, I hope that uh, answers your question. And I know that we said don't make it complicated, and then we made it sound a lot more complicated than it needed to be. But just... check out more episodes <laughs> for 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 fertilizing made semi potentially, hopefully, a little bit easier. <laughs> People are going to be afraid to fertilize now. What have we done? Um, all right. Let's let's talk about what's going on a little bit in our lives. Um, okay. So, <laughs> any any fun plant updates on on your side, Michelle? Well, I've got a really fun one. Um, uh, as I've mentioned before, I really like to collect plants, and one of my favorite plants in my collection is my Anthurium clarinervium, and. Uh, I've kind of played around with this one for a little while and I've pollinated it with its own pollen. It's pretty easy. Uh, so I pollinate it with its own pollen onto little seed or onto like little seed stem. I don't really know the name of this one, but like little seed stem things that are uh, ready for pollen, which means they're basically like oozing water. Um, and so I take some of the pollen from an older flower. I put it onto the oozing one and it takes literally the amount of time that it takes to grow a human child. It takes about eight months for these seeds to ripen um, and become ready to plant. And you know they're ripe because the seeds will swell up and that takes about six, seven months. Um, and they get really big and bulky and um, they look kind of silly on this little seed stem thing here. But then when they turn bright orange, it means that they are ripe, kind of like a banana. Banana is like green, and then it turns yellow. It's similar with these seeds. And after a <laughs> gestation period of eight months, I finally have some seeds. And what's really fun is once I break into these things, uh, I don't know if each seed pod is going to have one or if it's going to have two seeds. You don't know until you break them open. So for those of you listening, Michelle is right now holding up the the spadix from her anthurium, and we can see the bright orange fruits um, on it. If you are super curious, check out the video on YouTube. It's Plant Prescription Episode Two. Spadex. It is very. It is. It is very interesting to 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 see. It's very weird too how some did not take 
and others did. I found that the ones on the base of the spadex, thank you so much, Justin, those are the seeds that typically take versus the ones on the end. I think the way, because what I do, um, I take a... <laughs> This is gonna I, this is gonna gross a lot of people out. I'm so sorry. I'm really not a gross person, but I take a makeup brush, like an eyeshadow brush, uh, and I brush off the pollen and then I brush it on. But I typically start at the base, and so I think what's happening is the base is getting all of that pollen, and it's not getting onto the upper part of the spadex. Also, funny to mention, if you're trying to do this, if you have an anterior and clear nervium, uh, you can self pollinate. You don't need two plants for it. It'll you just need multiple flowers because the female will mature after the male. And so you need to have two in order to pollinate because you, you can't pollinate on the same spadex or flower, whatever. Um, and then typically the ones on the tip of the spadex mature much slower and they don't get those water droplets. It's the ones at the base that start maturing earlier. So really fun stuff. Learned a lot over the years with this Anthurium clarinervium. But yeah, it takes a lot of patience. Um, I remember when I moved, I'm oh, sorry, last tangent. I know I've done a lot of tangents, but when I moved into my house, I had like two or three or four seed pods that I was waiting on. And because everything was chaotic, we put the plant on the floor and then we just put a box and I totally smashed one of the flowers that was like weeks away from harvesting. And I was Aww. devastated because it takes eight months. But anyway, that's my exciting news. You That's got anything, awesome Justin? News. Um, no, I'll leave it all to you this week. <laughs> okay, all right. And maybe I'll have something cool to talk about next week. Okay, all right. Um, also, I hope our, our listeners are not getting too tired of us talking so much today. I'm so sorry again. No, no, no. It's, it's the bugs. I think it's, it's me. It's the mites. Um, let's break a plant misconception. All right, so, let's do it. Uh, misting for humidity. Yeah, we see that all the time. Practically everybody says, yeah, mist, mist your plants. Mm -hmm. um, and my take on it is that it's much more therapeutic for you, the act of misting, than it is for your plant. Yeah, that's a good theory because it doesn't do want, add humidity. Do you want to break down the science for us, Michelle? I will do my best, but I just botched Spadex, so apparently I'm not on my A game today. Uh, so when you're misting a plant, you are adding water to the surface of the plant, but you are not adding water to the air um, because to add humidity, the droplet size has to be very, very, very tiny. In fact, you could be desiccating your plant a little bit when you spray it with water because the act of that water evaporating may pull a little bit from your plant as well. Not a whole lot. I wouldn't, I'm not going to say your plant's going to desiccate, but what you could be doing, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, focused on disease and bugs here, is if you keep your plants wet, like if you keep the foliage wet, you could actually be setting it up for a fungal infection or a bacterial infection. Um, high humidity is great for a lot of plants, but sitting water on leaves is not great for most all plants. Um, and so, you know, I, there's a lot of ways to add humidity. You can get a humidifier. Um, what I like to do is I like to cram all of my plants into one space and the humidity I've tracked, it goes from 20% to 80%. Um, especially if you water your plants after it gets really humid in there. Uh, but misting, you're not, you're not doing anything, but potentially setting it up for a fungal infection, but if, you if want it's to therapeutic to you, it could help with, you know, cleaning maybe, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna add humidity. Yeah. If, if you want to add humidity, grouping your plants together or getting an actual humidifier for the room that they're in much better way to go. Yep. Be careful you don't take it too far, though. We'll go over that another day. <laughs> I've done that, too. Anyway. So that's a wrap. We hope you guys had as much fun as we did. We hope you guys learned a little bit from uh, Michelle and, and, and my wisdom. Um, don't forget, if you'd like to get your questions answered, please just reach out. Um, and maybe we'll feature you on a future episode. And to close, this episode was sponsored by Monstera Deliciosa. If you're looking for an easy care house plant with big tropical leaves, uh, definitely look for Monstera Deliciosa. It doesn't mind if you neglect it. It's big on appeal. Monstera Deliciosa is available at your favorite local plant shop. Find one today. And fertilize it with 2010-20. Or not. Up to you. 
All right, everybody, thank you very much. Happy gardening from your friends at Costa Farms, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.